Hi, my name's Donal. I'm a sound engineer known for working with Sting and loving DPA microphones. The first thing I did seriously where we recorded a lot with Omni was um, Sting's uh, Labyrinth album. So I got hold of a pair of DPA 4006s, put them up on the bar, spaced A and B, put them in front of him. And then I, I sort of stood there listening to where the mics were. And then I went back to the speakers, turned them on, and I was like, well, it just seems, sounds the same. That is that is that sound. There isn't, because a, a normal cardioid mic, you wherever you place it, you are creating something that's not completely natural because you don't actually, as the listener, sit that close. I mean, it's a sound we're all used to, but it's not the real sound. And um, the space pair of A and B, I call it A and B, uh, Omnis was like, wow, that just sounds like I'm standing in front of Edin playing. And, um, and then obviously I started experimenting and tried it on piano and, and it just became like a real favorite, really. Well, the 4011 came a little bit later after the 4006, and that's just a very sweet, natural sounding cardioid microphone. We did use it, I did use it for vocals on the uh, winter album when we shot live at Durham. And I think that became uh, the de facto, in fact, that, that capsule. And it, they changed the capsule so that it was less sensitive to um, mic popping. Um, but again, it's just a really natural, rich, sounding microphone and I don't mean it adds that it just seems to record that uh, I don't think the DPA do that they don't enhance it with an EQ system of any sort it just sounds really clean and natural well the um, the 4099s I'm using the vintage classic version now because um, I haven't upgraded to the new more focused versions but um, I just find them they're just brilliantly adaptable little mics that don't sound like a little mic that's what I love about them. And I think one of the best things is all the different attachments. So with the drum clips, uh, it's just easy. It's not, it, I'm not fighting my way with a mic stand to get into somebody's drum kit. And every drummer likes to set up as they like it to be, as it should be. And as a sound engineer, I shouldn't be cluttering that up for them and going, oh, how do I get my mic stand in so I can get my mic in? I don't need to do any of that. I just lean in, clip it on, walk away. I might have to drag the cable a bit, but and they're happy. Their kit still looks good. They love drummers love to walk away, look at their kit, and think, looks good. And if I've covered it in dodgy mic stands, I'm not giving them that vibe. So that's a win from that straight off first point of view. Um, and they sound great. So I started working with Sting in 2000 stroke 2001 uh, for the All This Time live album, which was recorded at his house in Italy. And uh, we set up and we rehearsed there. And, and then we shot this, filmed this album effectively that was going to be All This Time. Unfortunately, it happened on September uh, 11th. So it, it wasn't the album that anyone thought they were making, um, which is actually what often happens with making albums, not something on that horrible level, but you start to make a record in one way and it can quite often end up as a totally different project, but it was definitely a journey. I, I actually would always go with um, natural reverb. I love a natural reverb. I have this, I have this the room that I ended up doing um, my front of house first experience with Sting was in Singapore. Not only was I discovering that I was the front of house engineer for the day, which was a bit threatening, we were doing an acoustic set in what appeared to be a completely dead room. Uh, although it was a wooden concert hall, it was dead. And I was like, this isn't really good for me. Um, and the only thing that got the team there motivated really was, they said, oh no, this room can be live. And I went, really? How? And they, Turns out there was loads of echo chambers at the top of the room and they pressed a button and all the doors opened and it went from dead to something like three or four seconds of reverb. And I was like, that is amazing. And suddenly it opened up. I didn't need to use any reverb on the console and Sting could sing in the room with very little in the monitors because he could hear himself. Um, and I loved that. Unfortunately, you can record that sort of reverb and it sounds great at the time, but in the mix, 
it, it's more often than not, I find it doesn't work in a mix when you start manipulating the sound, especially if you overdub with something else that's dry, then you end up using some sort of artificial reverb. Um, so my answer would be, yes, always natural, always record it. Unfortunately, generally I end up using, either enhancing it with an artificial or replacing it. So compressors and limiters, the sound engineer's friend, apparently. Um, I record through compression, um, but I'm just tweaking. It's more of a safety net, really. Uh, so, it, for instance, if I'm a sting, I record with a bit of compression, but three to five dB maximum, really. It's just taking the edge off it. Um, and then, I, you know, if I'm going to really compress it or come up with a a, a treatment, I'll do that on, on the playback side, as it were. Um, it's, it's just a safety net. The, the best way to record, I think, is generally with just a mic and a mic amp. You know, sometimes you need a little bit of help to keep the level in control.